Hello and welcome back to the channel. Bit of a diversion here because we're going to look at some Fallout news. Um, as you might or might not know, they're making a TV series based on the Fallout series. And this is being produced on Amazon Prime. And it's apparently out next year, out next April. So yeah, I've been very excited about this. I'm a great Fallout fan. I'm a filthy casual though. I can't pretend to be a huge expert. Virtually what I've played is Fallout 4, although many, many times. And Fallout 76, which I will defend to anyone. I think that's a great game if you've not played it. Yeah, I played that for about three years solid from the first day it came out and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, I must say. I might go back to it as well. Anyhow, this is an article from Vanity Fair, an exclusive by Mr. Anthony Bresnikan, I think he's called. And he's just going to ramble through and tell us what he knows about Fallout. So first up, we can see, I think this is going to be the star of the show. This young lady's name is Lucy, and as you can tell, she's a vault dweller, and she's escaped, well, I say escaped, she's leaving Vault 33 to do something. We're not quite sure what. So the actress's name is Ella Purnell, and it says Ella Purnell emerges from her underground vault in Fallout. But let's read on. Fallout often looks like the distant past, but it's really the far off future, and actually it's the end of life as we know it. In the new series, debuting on Amazon Prime Video on April 12th, a nuclear war breaks out across Earth in the year 2077, which is, or was, an era of robots, hovercars, and a deep and abiding nostalgia for the America of the 1940s. Everything from the clothes, to the entertainment, to the vehicles mimic the look of that bygone age, albeit with a sci-fi tilt. That retro-futuristic aesthetic was one of the charms of the mega-selling video game series that inspired the show. And I will take some issue with 1940s, because as I understand it, most of the design ethos of Fallout comes from the late 50s, early 60s. In fact, I've heard 1962 mentioned as a reference date, and that's probably based on the release dates of the music used in the game. So I'm not quite sure if the writer of this article just doesn't know much about Fallout, which is more than likely, or whether he's been fed inaccurate information by the production company that's producing this show, which is Kilter Films. But you'd hope they would know, wouldn't you, really? Anyway, reading on. Mass Extinction is just the starting point for Fallout, which was developed for TV by Westworld creators and husband and wife Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy. After the incendiary mushroom clouds, the story flashes forward 219 years. How did humanity fare over those two blighted centuries? Lucy, one of the lead characters, played by Yellow Jacket star Ella Purnell, has no clue. She has lived her entire life inside a subterranean vault, where every need and want has been satisfied, while generations and generations await the day when it's safe to surface. And again, I'll take a little bit of issue with that, because life inside a vault isn't very pleasant, I don't think, being locked underground in a rather claustrophobic atmosphere. But again, you know, people in the vaults are having a much better time of it than those on the surface, so perhaps he's got a point. Here's another image. This is Lucy and Kyle McLachlan, and Kyle is playing the vault overseer called Hank. And as far as I'm aware, there's no suggestion that this is one of the experimental vaults. If you're not familiar with Fallout, there are loads and loads of these vaults scattered around America, and more than a few of them are actually experimental, where they were carrying out long-term studies on the inhabitants of the vault to see how they'd react to various things, and it's all rather unpleasant. So if this is an experimental vault, then the overseer Hank will know about it, so that could be quite interesting. When a crisis forces Lucy to venture above on a rescue mission, she finds that the planet above remains a hellscape, <laughs> crawling with giant insects, voracious mutant animal abominations, and a human population of sun-baked miscreants <laughs> who make the manners, morals, and hygiene of the gunslinging Old West look like Downton Abbey, and I think that's a very fair description. The games are about the culture of division and haves and have-nots that unfortunately have only gotten more and more cute in this country and around the world over the last decades, Nolan tells Vanity Fair. Lucy's nice, but Lucy's naive. In the Fallout universe, the human beings fortunate enough to ride out the apocalypse in underground communities only had that option available to them because they had money. Forcing Doe-Eyed Lucy into this sadistic Darwinian remnant of civilization opens the door for Fallout to engage in some social satire as well as action and adventure. 
And again, I would take a bit of issue with that description because the people in the vaults weren't just rich people. They were people who could be useful. And as I've already mentioned, most of them were experimental subjects. So again, not entirely accurate, but this could possibly just be the author's takeaway. It doesn't really sound like he knows too much about Fallout. Like HBO's hit The Last of Us, which was also adapted from a blockbuster video game, The End of the World offers a rich opportunity to comment on the real one. We get to talk about that in a wonderful speculative fiction way, says Nolan, who directed the first three episodes. I think we're all looking at the world and going, God <laughs> seems to be heading in a very, very frightening direction. A little bit pessimistic. As Westworld demonstrated, Nolan has a fascination with a mix of mythology and psychology that makes up human nature. His characters typically believe one thing about themselves, while behaving in a radically different way under pressure. He previously created the series Person of Interest, which I've never seen, about a world in which crimes and terrorism can be predicted in advance, and co-wrote such films as The Prestige, which is very good, Dark Knight, also very good, and Interstellar, so that's three very good, with his filmmaker brother Christopher Nolan. And yeah, <laughs> I can't help but feeling that they're good because Christopher Nolan wrote them. Jonathan, who goes by Jonah for some reason, is fond of plunging his fictional test subjects into situations that unsettle their deeply held beliefs. So many of us have such naive ideas, even now, about everyone else's experiences. And it's one of the things I love about America, is this giant manic collection of different experiences, different points of view, Nolan says. Desperation only exacerbates those fissures in Fallout, as Pernell's do-gooder soon discovers. Lucy is charming and plucky and strong, well, I'm glad she's a strong woman, and then you'll see she's confronted with the reality of, hey, maybe the supposedly virtuous things you grew up with are not necessarily that virtuous. If they are virtuous, they're couched in a circumstantial virtuousness. It's a luxury virtue. You can have your point of view because you never ran out of food, right? You guys were able to share everything because you had enough to share. And this observation, you know, that the vault might not have been very virtuous, gives credence to the idea that this could be an experimental vault. And Lucy's father obviously knows that, but Lucy doesn't. So that's quite interesting. The Fallout series tracks her collision with the hard reality of other people's experiences and what happened to the people who, frankly, were left behind to die, Nolan says. Very cool picture here, got loads and loads of power armour, looking quite nice. I've heard a few people complain about this, saying that it doesn't look very realistic compared to the game. But I think we have to remember that real actors had to wear these outfits and move around in them. Yeah, some of the suits in the game look distinctly uncomfortable, I must say. And the caption for this image is a squad of soldiers from the Brotherhood of Steel in their power armour suits in the new series Fallout. But no, I'm encouraged by that, I think it looks nice. Fallout is leavened by the same twisted sense of humour that made the video game so appealing. The ubiquitous logo of Lucy's people, the Vault Dwellers, is a winking cartoon who perpetually flashes a giant smile and the thumbs up sign. This Vault Boy iconography originated in the game and was intended as an ironic tone-deaf contrast to the hard scrabble existence of those who endure on the surface. I don't think that's true. I think Vault Boy was invented as an icon years before the war. So it could never have been intended as a tone-deaf contrast to anything, could it, really? Nolan and Joy's determination to maintain that mordant comedy was the key to making the world work as a series, says game maker Todd Howard, the director of 2008 Fallout 3 and 2015 Fallout 4, an executive producer at Bethesda Game Studios, which developed the franchise. We had a lot of conversations over the style of humour, the level of violence, and the style of violence, says Howard who's also an executive producer for the show. Look, Fallout could be very dramatic and dark and post-apocalyptic, but you need to weave in a bit of a wink. <laughs> I think they threaded that needle really well on the TV show. Vault Boy not only appears in the show, but the imagery even gets an origin story, which we won't spoil here. That was something that they came up with that's just really smart, Howard says. And to be honest with you, the last thing I want is an origin story for Vault Boy. I think it shows a bit of a lack of imagination where you're constantly trying to invent backstories for things. You know, I'm just hoping we don't get something really cringy like the Han Solo origin that was delivered up in the Solo movie, which is, ugh. But on the other hand, it could be quite fun, so we'll just have to wait and see, I suppose. 
Fans of the game should know that everything in the series is officially part of Fallout lore, and Bethesda was careful to make sure that the scripts could coexist with previous storylines from the gaming titles. We view what's happening in the show as canon, says Howard. That's what's great, when someone else looks at your work and then translates it in some fashion. He admits to being envious of some of the TV show's interpretations and additions. I sort of looked at it like, ah, why didn't we do that? Down here we see one of the Brotherhood airships. Very impressive. I have to say one of my favourite moments in Fallout 4 is where you see one of these airships appearing out of nowhere. To me it was totally unexpected and I'd never seen anything like it. It was a really great moment. And that looks very nice. That looks very nice indeed. And the caption to this picture is Brotherhood of Steel Recruits. Gaze upon the vertibirds hovering round an airship called the Caswenum, marvelling at the rare pieces of high-functioning hardware. Yes, and I think we'd all marvel, wouldn't we? Lovely to see the vertibirds. The prospect for a Fallout film or TV show has been in the ether for years, but Howard was always resistant to it. I've taken countless meetings with producers or heard pitches, and nothing ever felt like the right fit, he says. Or well, maybe I was wondering a little, how will it affect the franchise? I took a very cautious approach. Howard is an admirer of Interstellar, which he cites as one of the inspirations for Bethesda's latest game, Starfield, a massive open world story that allows players to build their own characters and starships to explore more than a thousand planets scattered throughout the Milky Way. I've heard Starfield isn't brilliant, really. There's a lot of people who enjoy it, but it's a huge galaxy you can explore, but everything's pretty much the same, as I understand it. The movies he's worked on are some of my favourites, and I'd heard that he liked video games and had an eye for that stuff, Howard says. I'd said to someone, and I won't say who, but I was taking a meeting with another producer and said, before I talk to other people, I want to hear that Jonah Nolan says he'll never do it. That led to a conversation between the two, and Nolan was actually interested. He and Joy acquired the rights through their Kills of Films production company, then set about inventing new characters and trials and tribulations with executive producers and writers Geneva robertson Dwaret, co-writer of 2019's Captain Marvel, oh dear, and Graham Wagner, a veteran of The Office, Portlandia and Silicon Valley, who served as Fallout showrunners. So Captain Marvel, not a good sign, but The Office, Portlandia, Silicon Valley have got very good reputations. Though I've only ever seen The Office, so I can't comment on the other two. Howard says he and Bethesda were sold when Nolan and his team proposed building an entirely new story within the existing realm Fallout. I did not want to do an interpretation of an existing story we did, Howard says. That was the other thing. A lot of pitches were, you know, this is the movie of Fallout 3. And I was like, yeah, we told that story. I don't have a lot of interest seeing those translated. I was interested in someone telling a unique Fallout story, treat it like a game. It gives the creators of the series their own playground to play in. And I agree, I would much rather see an original Fallout story than try and adapt, you know, I don't know, the story of Fallout 4, which isn't great. Let's face it, I love the game, but the story is pants. Let's go down, another cool picture. And this one says, Arun Moton as Maximus, the new squire for a power suit knight, dispatched on behalf of the Brotherhood of Steel. And I'm sure I've seen that gun in the game. Absolutely positive. If I can think of the name, I'll put it on the screen now, but that gun looks really familiar. As the Fallout show progresses, Lucy's journey intersects with two other lead characters who are new to the universe. One of them is wannabe soldier Maximus, Arun Moton, the tragic P.T. from The Night Of, never heard of it, but this is the guy we just saw, and he grew up above ground, but like Lucy, was also raised in a cloistered family of sorts, a brutal collective of warriors called the Brotherhood of Steel. Again, this is probably the writer not knowing what he's talking about, but the Brotherhood of Steel isn't a collective of warriors, it's an organisation. You join the Brotherhood of Steel. If it was a collective, you'd have all these disparate warriors coming together to form a collective, which isn't the case. It's a little bit of the Marine Corps, it's a little bit of the Knights Templar, it's this kind of weird fusion, Nolan says. In the absence of a federal government, you just had all this military hardware lying around. Who would get it and how would they maintain control of it? The answer is the Brotherhood, which Nolan describes as being fueled by a mutated version of patriotism, religion, loyalty and fraternity. 
Their control comes from the battalions of super soldier knights in shining power armor, who stalk the landscape enforcing the Brotherhood's notion of order. Maximus fills a role that's straight out of medieval times. He's a squire, Nolan says. This is drawing on the classic Arthurian knight legends, where life was cheap and you had a squire as long as they were useful. They had to prove their worth, they had to prove their valour and their strength, and if they didn't, they were kind of cast aside. Yeah, well, I've never thought the Brotherhood of Steel as knights as such, and if that's the direction they're going, I'm not that enamoured, frankly. As far as I'm concerned, they're just sort of regular army. Anyhow, going down, we've got another nice image here. This is Ella Pennell's Lucy enters Philly, an apparent junkyard that is actually a town of survivors in the remnants of Greater Los Angeles who cobbled together their village from scrap. Very fallout, you'll agree. Let's go down. Max serves the giant's seemingly robotic figure of his master with the same naive faith that Lucy has in her vault dwellers. But unlike her, he has a cynical sense of self-preservation that leads him not to always behave honourably or heroically. One of the things we're trying to gently sidestep here is that kind of binary thinking, like they're the good guys or the bad guys, Nolan says. Whoever the good guys and the bad guys were, they destroyed the whole world. So now we're in a much more grey area. Fallout's world is filled by a sprawling ensemble, including Carl McLachlan as Lucy's father, the overseer of Vault 33, which essentially makes him the mayor of their hometown, while Homeland's Sarita Chowdhury is a different kind of leader in this world, willing to sacrifice anything for her band of people. Moises Arias, who as a child played Rico on Hannah Montana, okay, <laughs> co-stars as Lucy's inquisitive brother. Michael Emerson, who starred in Nolan's Person of Interest, and is best known as hatch inhabitant Benjamin Linus on Lost, stays above ground this time, playing an enigmatic researcher named Wilzig. Most of the disparate parties are chasing an artifact that has the potential to radically change the power dynamic in this world, as Nolan puts it. And I have to say, that's a bit of a red flag for me, because I don't want a story when loads of people are just running around the map chasing a MacGuffin all the time. That sounds very bad robot to me, which is not a good thing. Anyway, going down, we see a lovely picture of a ghoul. And this is Walton Goggins. Walton Goggins in a moment of repose as the ghoul in the upcoming Fallout series. Then there is Fallout's wild card, its third lead figure, the sinister bounty hunter known as the ghoul, played by Django Unchained and the hateful eight's Walton Goggins. Also from The Shield, let's not forget. Very good in that. The ghoul is a gruesomely scarred rough rider who has a code of honour, but also a ruthless streak. He's the good, the bad and the ugly rolled into one, which I rather like. He's also quite a survivor, having existed for hundreds of years. The show occasionally flashes back to the human being he once was, a father and husband named Cooper Howard, before the nuclear holocaust turned the world into a cinder and transformed him into an undead, noseless, sharpshooting fiend. Are, are ghouls undead? I don't think they are. I don't think they are anyway. In the Fallout games, ghouls are typically cannon fodder, mindless zombies whose bodies have been mutated by radiation. The ghoul is a legend, distinct amongst his kind for his cleverness and cunning. There's still something of Cooper Howard, the person he used to be, within this desiccated form. Walton's equally adept at drama and comedy, which is so difficult, Nolan says. There is a chasm in time and distance between who this guy was and who he's become, which for me creates an enormous dramatic question. What happened to this guy? So we'll walk backwards into that. Okay, well that's a fairly obvious question, isn't it? What happened to this guy? Okay, so I won't give you 10 out of 10 for imagination there, Nolan. He compares the ghoul to the poet Virgil in Dante's Inferno. He becomes our guide and our protagonist in that older world, even as we understand him to be the antagonist at the ends of the world, Nolan says. Rather clumsy sentence. So it looks like the ghoul is going to be the bad guy, although a sympathetic one. Also, I don't like the name The Ghoul. I don't think anyone would be known as The Ghoul in Fallout, would they? I mean, if you said The Ghoul, people would always be asking, well, which ghoul exactly are you talking about? Seems rather a silly name. Anyhow, the games have already created a template for how creatures like him look but that was dialed back for Goggin's character. For one, he's smarter than the average ghoul. He would naturally have a different physique and face. No, he wouldn't. He might look exactly like all the other ghouls. That wouldn't affect his intelligence, would it? 
there's also a practical reason to make him less ghoulish. You have to be extremely careful when you're putting a full appliance on someone's face, because you hide that actor for a reason, Nolan says. Their face is their instrument. You want the tiny little expressions <laughs> and changes that they make. Yeah, you want them to act, in other words, I suppose. And here's a close-up of Goggins in all his glory. And it's a bit unfortunate that we have to keep staring up his nose all the time, isn't it? But never mind. But he's looking pretty good, I must say. A very believable ghoul. And the caption here says, The missing nose gives the ghoul corpse-like appearance. He has actually survived for many centuries, so he's not dead. Prosthetics designer Vincent van Dyke, who worked on Leonardo DiCaprio's character in The Killers of the Flower Moon, devised the look of the ghoul. I need to be able to see Walton and his performance. He needs to look like a ghoul from the game. And he needs to be kind of hot, Nolan <laughs> says. Okay, the ghoul actually reminds me of um, the character of Hancock. What's his name? John Hancock, who's the mayor of that town in Fallout 4. To me, it's sort of a mixture between Hancock and Nick Valentine, which could be quite nice. Anyhow, it goes on. That last part turned out to be literally true. The first day we were shooting with Walton in makeup, he comes to set and I'm looking at him like, Walton, are you crying? And he just had sweat leaking out of the prosthetics under his eyes because it was so hot. So cool story, bro. Cool story. Um, if Lucy is the innocent of the show, then the ghoul is her polar opposite. Damaged and hardened by his centuries of endless life in a state of near death. He's got a lot of mileage on him, but he's still got a swagger and a kind of charm to him, Nolan says. So very much like Hancock. Like its anti-heroes, the world of Fallout has to maintain an appeal despite its grim aspects. It's a dark world in many ways, Nolan says, but the games were fun to play, fun to explore, and I think that was the mandate for us, to make sure it was enjoyable to spend time in this universe. And there we go, there's Lucy, and I think that might be Nolan, is it? Yes, Jonah Nolan. Poses with Ella Purnell in this behind-the-scenes image from the Fallout series. And she looks tiny, doesn't she? Unless he's really, really big. But yeah, liking the look of everything so far. Few red flags, but no, I'm I'm encouraged. Really, I'm encouraged. And the other behind-the-scenes pictures I've seen, you know, leaked here and there, have looked really, really nice. I think they've really captured the atmosphere of the game. So anyway, I hope you found that useful. You can go and read this article yourself if you like. It's not hidden behind a paywall or anything. But I hope you found that useful and interesting. I hope to see you for the next video. And until I do see you again, I should say goodbye. Okay then, cheerio!